Hello and welcome. My name is Weston Barr, and I'm here today to introduce my new tutorial series, Blender for Maya Artists. The goal of this series is to help users who have been traditionally using Maya, uh, most likely through their education, as that's pretty common, and this is to help them move over to alternatives such as Blender, uh, which is open source and free, uh, meaning you don't have to already have a job to be using it. Anyways, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over how to make Blender feel a little bit more like Maya. We're not going for total replication of the interface and interaction. What we're going for is something that'll help you uh, move over to Blender quicker. It'll help you make less uh, mistakes such as, uh, you know, using left click instead of right click. Because uh, uh, if you're aware, Blender by default selects with right click, which I personally think is insane. Um, so we'll go about setting up your, uh, your interactions with Blender to be a little bit more like Maya. From there, we're gonna go into, you know, it, uh, a UI overview, talk about, you know, things uh, like where's the outliner? How do you customize the actual UI? Um, from there, we're gonna go into, uh, well, included in that section is gonna be, you know, user settings, how to optimize a Blender for your hardware, um, such as whether you're rendering on CPU or GPU or multiple GPUs. Um, and once we get Blender all set up, uh, you know, technically like that, we're gonna move into setting custom hotkeys that just make sense, you know? They're gonna be helpful. They're not necessarily um, the hotkeys that are, that correlate to Maya, but they are the hotkeys that I think make the most sense for having an efficient modeling workflow. Uh, I say modeling because that's predominantly what I do in Blender. Uh, however, the same things should be applicable to other things in Blender, such as lighting, animating, you know, the likes. So once we've covered, let's just uh, move along here. Uh, we're going to talk about the hotkey setup. We're even going to go into a little bit of advanced hotkey setup, um, where we talk about how to set hotkeys for things that by default you can't set hotkeys for. Like for example, um, seeing through geometry, uh, which is called occlude geometry. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. We're also going to talk about Blender's startup file, which is how Blender will be presented every time you open a brand new file. Um, things that are included in that are, is there anything in the scene? By default, Blender uh, opens up and has a cube, a light, and a camera. For the most part, you probably don't need that, but maybe you want something more specific, like, uh, like a material cube, something like that. Um, from there, we're going to talk about some of the useful tools in Blender that may or may not be present in Maya, or if possible, if, if I can remember, we'll talk about the differences between certain tools and how you interact with them. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about modifiers, what they are, how to use them, the different settings to look for as you're using them, and just, you know, how they're helpful. Uh, we'll go over a lot of the common modeling ones, such as mirror, array, uh, shrink wrap, lattice, because that is a different one from Maya, um, screw, uh, all those modifiers we'll go over, and we'll talk about not only how to use them on their own, but also how to use them in conjunction with each other, and even what order they should be in when you're using them together to give the best result. Let's see, I think I need to go back into slides. Um, what are some prerequisites for this course? Blender installed on your computer, although actually due to 
um, a series of awful hard drive failures, I don't actually have Blender on my hard drive right now. So what I'm going to need to do is install it, so I may as well go through it with you guys to show you how. It's pretty simple, but there are a couple things that I'll point out um, that might optimize your exper experience a little bit. Uh, you'll want to have a computer that can support Blender, which I don't think is uh, very difficult. And hopefully you have at least a basic understanding of 3D programs and 3D concepts. Um, not to say that you'd be totally lost, but you might be lost. So in that case, I'd recommend that you go watch my Introduction to Maya course, although that is aimed more at um, high school age students. And last but not least, uh, you should want to learn Blender. Um, if you'd rather learn Modo, I recommend going and finding a different Modo specific <laughs> course. Um, so if you've got all of those things, uh, especially the desire to learn Blender, that's probably the most important one, uh, we can, you know, get going. Uh, oh, and the audience, you know, I've got to go through these slides. Uh, Maya users, that's, it's in the title. I want to make it easier, easier for people who have used Maya who want to switch over to, uh, you know, a free alternative. Um, new users to Blender. It's, I think it's a perfectly fine way to use Blender the way that I use it. Um, so, which, of course. Um, so if you're a new user looking to get into Blender, um, this might just be a way to see someone else's setup and how they've gone about using it, or how I've gone about using it, um, which may or may not make it a little easier for you getting started in Blender. Uh, and lastly, uh, Blender users who just need a refresher. You might learn something, so give it a watch. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, anyways, so we're going to get started. All right, I'm going to move this over here. And on my desktop, I have the installer for Blender 2.77a, which is the latest uh, stable release. So let's just go ahead and uh, get started. You know, this is a pretty standard installation, except the license without reading it. Uh, this is the first place, though, that we're going to change something. So by default, it installs to your C drive, which for most people is going to be perfectly fine, especially if you're using an SSD. Awesome. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on the root of my art drive, which is a, a separate SSD. So I want my Blender to be on the same hard drive that all of my working files are on. I don't actually know if this is necessary, but I don't think it'll hurt, and I want to try it out. So I'll give it a whirl. Um, it's going to create a folder called Blender Foundation, and Blender inside there, and then so on and so forth. Yep, we've got that, All right, and we're installing, yay. This is the fun part where we wait. Okay, we've got it. And let's open up Blender. So here we go. This is what we're going to see the very first time that we open Blender. So first, right in the middle, we have the splash screen, where it's, you can get to recently used files um, and you know some other different stuff, you know, donations, credits, manuals. Uh, from there, let's just talk about the interface real quick. I'm going to press N so that you can see uh, the transform menus and stuff. Let's, um, let's start at the very top right. I think this will be a good place to start. This is your outliner. You have the three items in your scene right now, 
and you have a world node and render layers, but you don't really need to worry about those two for now. Under here, we have the, what is this called? I want to say this is the, oh, I don't even remember. It's just the, uh, oh, it's the properties. My bad. <laughs> it's been a while since I talked about this stuff. Anyways, so here we have our scene tab, which we can use to change render settings, you know, resolution, samples, shading, uh, the performance, um, tile size, output, etc. Um, pretty, pretty standard settings there, you know. Notice that by default it's rendering at 50% size. Uh, that's probably not ideal. So let's just go ahead and set it to 100. Not that we're going to be doing any rendering, but you know, why not? Uh, next from there we have the scene render layers. Um, this is where you can add render layers, which we're not going to go into in this video, so let's gloss over that. And from here we have the scene tab, which, you know, you have your camera, uh, backgrounds. This is where you'll set units. Um, I use Imperial, mainly because I use it at work. Um, I also have a background in architecture, so Imperial units um, are just kind of how I think. Uh, you have things like color management and audio, which I doubt you'll really use often. You also have gravity, which is turned on by default, but I don't think you really need it unless you're doing simulations. So let's, uh, let's move on from there. You also have simplify. This is really only useful when you have massive scenes, like in the millions to tens of millions of polygons. Uh, that's when you would want to use simplify. You can either simplify the viewport so that you're only showing a certain amount of subdivisions, or you can sim uh, simplify your render view uh, if perhaps you're running out of CUDA cores. Uh, after that, we have the world node. This is where you can change things like ambient occlusion, environment lighting, where you would set, um, I believe, yeah, this is where you can set an HDR, HDRI image, uh, which will drastically improve your lighting. I recommend using it indirect lighting, gather stuff, so on and so forth. And after that, we have the object menu. This is where you're going to have things like, well, you have your transforms, although this is not the most ideal place to access your transforms. The quickest place is going to be the transform tab in the actual 3D view. So I, re I would recommend, you know, using that. Um, you have relations, and this is also not a great place to interact with, like, the parent of your object. You can, it's best to do that in the outliner. Groups as well. Um, I don't use groups very often in, in Blender. They're not quite the same as, as Maya. Um, so you don't actually have a group node that you can you know, move it around by, um, and so I just don't find it to be that useful to even use them. Under that you have display, which is probably the most us useful section in this, uh, in this tab. You have name, which you know, will just display the name at its origin. You have the axis, um, and then most, most helpful, I think you have the wireframe, which we're not gonna see on a cube like that because it's already in wireframe. Uh, draw all edges, which will make sure that every edge is drawn, um, you know, when wireframe is visible. And then you also have maximum draw type. And this is helpful in a variety of situations. Um, like say you're using a cube as dimensional reference, right? You know the cube is two feet, so you, you know, you put set it to bounds or wire and you can see through it and thus line up, you know, a door or whatever you're working on. So you've got bounds, wireframe, which in this case it's, it's the same, um, solid, which is what it's in right now, and textured. Um, yeah, so those are the, the helpful ones there. 
Moving on, we have constraints, which we're not going to go into in this video, but you know, you can add various constraints. After that, we have modifiers, which we are going to go into this video, but you know, later. And there we have lots and lots of different modifiers. The main ones that we're going to focus on are ones in the generate tab and then a few in the deform tab. Those are going to be um, the main ones that we use. After that, you have, oh, what's this tab called? Data. This is object data. Um, things that are helpful here are vertex groups, shape keys, and UV maps. Uh, the main one that you use during the modeling step is probably going to be vertex groups. This is really helpful for, uh, these are essentially edge sets that you might have had, or selection sets in, um, in Maya. You know, you use them to load in a certain uh, selection. Pretty straightforward. Uh, shape keys are essentially blend shapes, if I understand cor that correctly. Not, or I, I don't personally use them too often in modeling, but you know, they do have their uses. And then you have UV maps for if you need multiple UV maps. After that, we have materials. Um, and right now, the default rendering engine is Cycle uh, Blender Render, which I don't recommend using. Let's switch that over to Cycles, and you can see that over here it changed. Um, yeah, so this is where you can start. You can see the overview of your materials. This isn't where you really want to edit your material, though. For that, you do that in the Node Editor. Um, which we're not going to go into in, the, in this. Then we have texture, which, you know, pretty much the same as uh, material. You just tell it what type of texture to load it in, make a new one, that sort of thing. Then we have particle systems and physics, neither of which we're going to go into in this video. All right, let's move on from there. Here we have our 3D view. Um, by default, it, you know, it's pretty big, which is good. Um, on the right side, we have the, oh, I want to say properties tab, something like that. We have location, rotation, scale, dimensions. This is something that's different from uh, Maya. You can actually adjust the, the bounding box dimensions of the object, meaning I can set this to 10, which is going to be 10 feet. And notice how it scales it uh, so that it fits that dimension. This is incredibly useful uh, when modeling. For example, you know you need a sphere that's a quarter of an inch, but you didn't make it at a quarter of an inch. So you use that to fix that. Under that, we have grease pencil, which I think Maya has a very similar thing. And below that, we have view which is um, going to be used fairly often. You're going to set your lens angle. I think by default I use 55. You have your start and end clipping planes. This is going to be how the, uh, the camera clips. I usually just set this to the lowest value because I like to get all up in there. Under that, we have 3D Cursor. Uh, 3D Cursor is also um, not present in Maya. What 3D Cursor is, it's essentially, well, it's a cursor that you can place manually um, or automatically to, to tell Blender to do various different things. For example, when you create a new object, it's always going to be centered at the 3D cursor. Um, so that could mean that if you want a cube to be created 10 feet from the origin, you could set you know, the 3D cursor location to be 10 feet from the origin, and then it would be created there. It's handy. You can also do things like set the pivot point of your object to 3D cursor, or um, set the manipulator to the 3D cursor. Um, under that, you have item. It just tells you what item it is. Super handy. Um, <laughs> under that, we have display. 
Uh, here you can do things like only what's going to be rendered. Show the world background, which is also gray right now, so <laughs> helpful. Um, outline selected. You know, all of these things you can generally leave pretty much the same. You can toggle quad view, but I found that I actually never use quad view. Um, I used it plenty in Maya, but I've almost never needed it in Blender. Under that we have shading. Um, you have things like back face culling, ambient occlusion, uh, just showing it as a textured solid, which you know is the normal view, I guess, uh, if you're in textured view. And then the, the different one is matte cap. And if you use ZBrush, you're probably familiar with matte caps. And these are just different kind of pre-made materials that you can put on. Uh, these are really great um, because for one, I don't think Blender's default material is very visually pleasing. Um, it's not exactly easy to look at. So you can change things um, and get a little bit of different effect, including some specularity, which is great for finding bumps on your model when you know, you're trying to have a smooth surface. Um, the ones that I personally prefer are the white one, the tan one, the gray one, and the silver and gold. You might think it's odd to model on a gold model, but for some reason I find it to be effective. And under that you have motion tracking, which we're not going to talk about, background images, which is not the best way to do reference images. Um, just put an image on a plane. That's going to be the easiest way to do this in Blender because otherwise you have to do all of this nonsense and position it. And transform orientations, you know, view, normal, local, that sort of thing. That's also not the most convenient place to get that sort of thing, so uh, I digress. Moving over to the other side, we have lots of different tabs. We have tools, the creation menus, relationships, you know, parenting and stuff, animation, physics, and grease pencil. The common ones for modeling, of course, are going to be tools and create. Um, all of which can actually be accessed without these menus, by the way. Um, so we'll go into how to access those later. Under that we have the timeline, which we're not going to go into very much. Um, right now, I think I'll show you guys real quick just how to modify the layout of your UI. So I'm going to right click on the border there click join area, and then click downwards. This is gonna get rid of the timeline. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click and drag these top, uh, these three diagonal dashes out, and that is duplicating the window over. Then I'm gonna do it again, but I'm instead gonna drag down. The reason for this is now I can click here, and I'm gonna change this to be the node editor. So that I can have some control over my, uh, you know, materials as I'm modeling. And then I'm also going to change this to be the UV image editor. So this is my preferred modeling um, setup. <clears throat> uh, back to the 3D view, we're just going to real quick talk about these different menus. You have view, select, add, object. You have different uh, interaction modes. You have object mode, edit mode, where you, you, know, you actually interact with the components of the model. Sculpt mode for sculpting, etc. Um, then you have viewport shading, all the way down from bounding box to wireframe, solid, texture, material, all the way up to rendered. Um, and Blender does support viewport rendering, uh, render preview, which is lovely. Um, that's going to be annoying that down there. And here we have the pivot point. Um, the default is median point, which for the most part works. However, using individual origins is helpful at, in, you know, in certain use uh, scenarios. Active element, which will put the pivot around the last clicked either object or component. So it could be, you know, a separate cube or it could be the vertice or an edge inside of your uh, current piece. From there, 
3D cursor. Like I said, this is gonna put the pivot at the 3D cursor, which is nice um, in, uh, in several situations that I'll go into later, or not at all, we'll see. And let's see, here you have your display layers. You have proportional editing, which is like soft select in Maya. And you have uh, different fall off modes. Also, the way that you change the fall off of proportional editing is using page up and page down. I believe the brackets also work, or your scroll wheel, that also works. Then you have uh, snap during transform, snapping. Uh, by default, it snaps to increment, which is not helpful. And one of the hotkeys that I'll show you how to make is how to set this to default to face or vertex, which those are much more helpful. And that's all we really need there. Um, okay, so we have talked about the interface. I'm going to pause this video. All right, well, actually, here, let's just do this. Uh, this will be the end of this video, and we'll come back in part two to discuss uh, preferences and setup. Uh, thank you, and I hope to see you next time.